oceans, lakes, rivers, ice, deep wells or clouds, still or moving, water is the source of our life. But as we learn to use water to travel, to grow food, to generate energy, to create healthy places, or simply to have fun, we also discovered how much our future depends on this vital resource. And while pollution drains life from our seas, rivers are drying, and access to water is an ever-growing challenge. We believe our journey with water is just starting. What if we could benefit more from our water systems by protecting them? What if we could turn the tide on the destruction of our oceans? What if we unlocked the deep ocean's floor secrets and continued exploring? While 1% of water is available to humankind, what if we understood its true economic and social cost? And what if we could advance women and children's health and education by achieving universal access to water? We believe we can by sharing our knowledge, inspiring each other, by better understanding and protecting Earth's waters. We believe it is possible to build a brighter future. So, what if it started here, today? And good afternoon and welcome to uh, today's World Modulus. Uh, Deep Blue, the other uh, final frontier, undiscovered wonders of the ocean. I'm John Defteris, a former CNN Emerging Markets editor, now a professor at NYU Abu Dhabi, amongst other things in my uh, 2.0 career. Uh, this is the first part of Water Week at Expo 2020, and we want to also welcome to the Terra Pavilion uh, the live audience that's watching us here uh, as we stream out the discussion. This is brought uh, to you in association with the Portugal Pavilion, so we appreciate uh, your support for this uh, debate, a very important one. Uh, when we think of the, uh, the final frontier, the other final frontier, uh, initially I thought, okay, this is about space, right? We have to look up and see what's out there. But in fact, the, the nether final frontier is the deep ocean, uh, covering, what, 70% of the surface of the world and, and there's a figure out there that 80% of it is unmapped and unexplored. Uh, nobody's against exploration, but one would argue we're against exploitation, right? And that's part of the debate that we're going to have today. We absolutely have a fantastic panel with a lot of diversity, which will make it much more interesting in terms of the different perspectives on this, uh, the final frontiers, one of two uh, around the world. The format is it's like a modulus setting if those who live in the UAE or are visiting the expo for the first time, uh, a living room setting. That's why it's designed this way. But it's designed to share information and share concepts on this uh, final frontier, which is very important. And there are so many topics and so many directions we can go into, but we want to try to allow at least 15 to 20 minutes to take questions from the audience uh, in person here. So we appreciate you. Uh, attending here and the great viewership that we have around the world with this focus on uh, the Expo 2020, which is opening a lot of doors in terms of the discussion. Let me introduce our, our panelists, and I'll do it uh, for you, stage left, with uh, Jason Pratt, the Senior Vice President uh, in charge of Group Health, Safety and Environment for DP World. He's far left here. He's uh, joined there by Melania Guerrero, a PhD engineer, oceanographer, and science diplomat and the Director of Science Strategy at Planet, uh, now based in uh, Germany, in the capital of Berlin, but originally from Costa Rica. Uh, to my direct right and uh, to your center left there is Jamie Ipster, Ambassador is for the Environment in the Department of Foreign Affairs, Trade uh, from the great government of uh, Australia. Uh, immediately to my left is His Excellency Ricardo Santos, the Minister of the Sea and the Government of Portugal. It's good to see you. Uh, we're going to have a video towards the end of this uh, session that's going to uh, lay out the kind of goals and the hosting by Portugal of the UN Oceans Conference uh, Climate uh, Gathering uh, June 27th to July 1st. We'll have the video for that. Kathleen Swalling is based here in Dubai in the UAE. Uh, she's a specialist in maritime law of Major Base Solutions uh, LLC, and it's good to see you. And last but certainly not least, we look forward to hearing from him, is Professor uh, Burton Jones. I'm going to call him in a very familiar American way, Bert. 
professor of oceanography. He's now at the Red Sea Research Center, uh, KAUST, uh, which is the King Abdullah University of Science and Technology, and he's working on the, the Red Sea project. I, I normally, in interview settings, and when you are limited to four or five minutes, we have 90 minutes, it's always a danger to go wide, as they say in the television journalism, because you can get somebody kind of wandering off, you can never get them back uh, on the ground, or in this case, back on the waters, right on the high seas. Uh, but I think it's a good place to start because we have so many different disciplines uh, here in the World Magilis this time when we look at this. And I thought, uh, Professor Bird, it would be a good way for you to start, and I think for each one of us around the table to share their views on the importance today, why this final frontier is so important, the relationship to climate, relationship to the human species, but also other species that live in this underexplored part of the world, basically. Do you want to start there? Sure, I'll be glad to. Thank you. You know, uh, the ocean is, is, is an amazing thing, and, and if we live in distinct parts of the world, we often think of our ocean. I, before coming to, to Saudi Arabia, I lived in California, so the Pacific Ocean, and we thought about our local ocean. But when you look at the whole ocean, I don't know if that graphic is available that Melania uh, brought up. If that one's available, that would be great to show right now. If we can so, show the image of the... Yes. So this there is a go. view of the ocean looking at it from the perspective of Antarctica. And this thing that becomes very clear is the Southern Ocean, which is the area surrounding Antarctica, connects basically the oceans of the world. So it's one ocean. We can't think of it as separately. Water circulation through the ocean takes about a thousand years. So if you put something in the ocean in, in, in eastern Canada and New Brunswick in about a thousand years, it will reappear there, but it, it will work its way around through the Indian Ocean, through the uh, Pacific Ocean, into the Atlantic. Just a brief note, I, we live in Saudi Arabia. The, the Red Sea is a semi-enclosed sea. Turns out you can find red seawater throughout the Indian Ocean, hmm. and it finally disappears, well, at least we're not able to trace it, when it enters the Southern Ocean. And so our water from the Red Sea goes all over the, Reds, all over the world through that. So, and the ocean is intimately uh, linked with climate. We, we talked about ocean and climate. The two, you, you can't separate the two. If we look at the current state of our world, heat and carbon dioxide are absorbed by the ocean, the excess carbon and heat. For that reason, we're looking at in, uh, increased acidity in the ocean, which affects the corals. The heat is going into the ocean, that's raising the level. We're seeing it through a combination of things. And, we're, uh, and then we're, that's, that heat, when the ocean heats, it expands. So that's one of the contributors to sea level. And so that will happen globally because the global ocean is heating. So when we look at it, we really have to think about it as, as one single source of water. So all of us, no matter where we're located, are intimately linked with that one ocean, that one primary source of water. That's a great way of putting it. Uh, Melania Guerra, I thought it'd be interesting to get your perspective because you were uh, born in uh, Costa Rica, and you have this unusual dynamic geographically because you have the Pacific on one side and the Atlantic right on the other in a very small uh, country. Uh, how do you want to pick up from where the professor left off and how you see the precious nature of the oceans? And you know, later in our conversation, we're going to talk about exploration and the, and the cause of the medical business, for example, or rare earth minerals as well. But let's start with your views on biodiversity and the precious nature of the oceans today. My perspectives on the ocean were greatly shaped by the place where I was born, the, the oceans I had access to, and the culture of Costa Ricans of living in peace with nature. However, I always sensed the oceans as something separate from the nature we were protecting that was the forests, the land, the trees. Uh, it wasn't until I started studying oceanography that I had the opportunity of being a scientist both in the Arctic and the Antarctic, and then it became really clear, that map became in my head very, very engraved, that when we talked about the oceans, it was a misnomer. 
that it's actually just the ocean, that all of them are connected. We cannot think of the Pacific Ocean as a silo where things happen independently for, from the other oceans. So for the rest of the remainder of the conversation, I'm always going to refer to as the ocean, uh, as all of them. And in terms of biodiversity, I think that uh, the world is starting to understand, and the pandemic probably heightened this, how connected we are to everything. So if the ocean is all connected, then we are also connected to everything in it. Uh, from the things we haven't discovered and that we have yet to explore for, um, to the things that we already depend on. Uh, for example, the oxygen in the atmosphere was created millions of years ago, uh, and for the majority of it, by the, by the photosynthesis of the plankton in the ocean. So when we think of, we always call the forest the lungs of the planet, mm. we are forgetting that the, the second lung is the pl plankton in the ocean. So that's to the degree that we are connected to the ocean. And, and I think starting to draw those connections and, and feel the ocean closer, whether we live on the coast or we live inland and far away, uh, how touched we are by the ocean is just starting to penetrate at the individ individual level, but also to the governments and to decision makers. We were having a, a backdoor uh, discussion in the, in the green room, if you will, about a number of different topics. We can go on for three hours, but we have phenomenal expertise here, and I want to be able to tap it. Uh, Kathleen Swalling, you come from a legal framework, and I was discussing the fact we had the Rio Agreement in 1992 and it dealt with climate, and then you say, how much progress have we made in the last 30 years? And then I said, okay, my premise was, is this going to serve as a huge challenge when we try to govern the oceans, right? And it, our national interest going to prevail? How do you get unity uh, at an international level? Uh, do you want to start there? How can you set the legal frameworks? How confident are you? that we can preserve the oceans and appreciate them for what they are? Um, I'm actually, I have a great belief in humanity. And I think given we come to understand that the oceans actually are what connects us all, as we've seen, or the ocean, should I say. <laughs> and the legal frameworks are indeed very complex, but I think what's important is when we understand some of the science, we have some of the science now. We understand that we're all interested in the ocean. It gives us 50% of the oxygen on the planet today. And um, the important thing with legal frameworks is that we have people involved. So we have people involved from the beginning, from the design right through the process to the enforcement process. So from my, my perspective, I've been lucky enough to design a large-scale um, refurbishment, if you like, of the original Great Barrier Reef. So we increased the protection there from, I think we had 4.5% protected, and we moved that to 33%. And we got that through both Houses of Parliament, mm. um, so that means that it was voted unanimously. So um, I, I think also now the way we're looking at treaties, um, I know that the call is to have... Um, everybody at the table to pull um, different stakeholders and, and people from different interests, including, you know, mining interests, scientists, governments, um, communities. We need to hear from them in the design process of our legal frameworks. And I think that's important is to balance both the science that we know and bringing stakeholders, having these discussions like we're having today, mm. having the conversation at an early stage and, and, and taking people on that journey. By that, they can then go back with their stakeholders and they can engage their stakeholders and, and people within their realms. And we start to create the awareness for legal frameworks to work. We need people to want to actually voluntarily support them. And then we only have to look at the enforcement for the few people that aren't engaged. So. Okay, very good. You're going to have to pull that mic back a little bit, just scratching again. There you go. I think that'll work for you. Thanks very much for that. Thank you. I'm saving our two government voices for the end because I want to take a different approach to this so I don't be disrespectful to either one of you, but I wanted to hear from industry before we did so. Uh, so, uh, Jason, it'd be interesting to say, okay, DP World is responsible for more than 10% of the global commerce that goes around in maritime trade today. It's, it's vital. And as an economic journalist, I've always kind of tracked this as a phenomenal industry in just-in-time logistics. The supply chain broke during the, the pandemic, and there's so much dependency on the industry. 
but it also has a lot of responsibility, right, and to act in a very sustainable way. How does that resonate uh, through DP World today? And because the technology, the new cleaner fuels are not on the market, so what do you do in the meantime? How do you see it, Jason? Well, well first of all, we, we don't think you can be in the future, uh, business in the future, unless you're sustainable. Um, and that's where the business has to go. Uh, we recently just had our strategy sessions with our leadership, business strategy, and every second word was almost, okay, how do we make sure this stays, becomes sustainable? So it's, uh, it's a big talking point for our, our organization. The, of our total carbon footprint, 70% is generated uh, from our marine services division, for example. It's also the most challenging right now in regards to the available technology or fuels that are on the market. It's probably going to be somewhat of a longer-term play for us, um, but we need to invest um, in various partnerships uh, now to sort of uh, R&D and technology. We, we have to get into it now. It, it's critical. Right. It's interesting because I remember the narrative because in my reporting for CNN, about half my time is on energy, and you talk to those in the shipping industry, well, this is impossible because we need this heavy bunker fuel, and we cannot have any innovation. It don't make the changes, and there were changes imposed on the industry, phased in over time. But if there's a will, there's a way. Do you see it that way from your perspective? Yeah, absolutely. You, you have to get the right key stakeholders together. Um, I think I mentioned to you previously, we just joined a partnership with uh, Maersk, McKinley and Moeller uh, Center of uh, Zero Carbon uh, Future for Shipping. And it's bringing key stakeholders together in regards to what we need to be working on now. And again, a lot on R&D. Um, what do the supply chain routes need to look like? What, where the, 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 the fut uh, fuels, the green fuels of the future, where do they have to be located along the supply chain? You know, some very, really critical things. And, and I, you know, I, a lot of this isn't going to come about until probably post 20, 30, 2040, 2030. So we've got to be working on it right now. It's mm -hmm. critical. Yeah. And, and it's, it also, you made a great point. It's, it's the infrastructure that you need to support it, not just in Dubai, obviously, but you're shipping yeah. around the world. So you need the global infrastructure. Your Excellency, uh, Minister Santos, uh, I started with the premise with uh, Professor Burt about the, the precious nature of the... Uh, of nature of the oceans. I mean, you're on the Atlantic. You have this very large exclusive economic zone that you've carved out. Uh, how does Portugal see its role as trying to set an example within the European Union, hosting the UN conference uh, in late June and going into July in this critical window of time? How do you see it? Okay. Uh, Portugal was always connected to the, the ocean. Yeah. It had not the, another route, but the ocean in those times. That's why you also gave the name of Pacific to the ocean. Pacific Ocean was Pernod de Magalhães. And I want to remember here that uh, we are commemorating now the 200 years of the global voyage of Fernando Magalhães and Sebastián del Cano. And uh, he, one day he encountered this very smooth, calm ocean that he named Pacific Ocean, Pacific, Oceano Pacifico. And uh, so, uh, uh, Portugal has a huge agenda concerning the oceans. Uh, we have, since 2007, a national strategy for the ocean that we uh, carefully implemented. And I would like to remember that in 98, we have the Expo 98 was dedicated to the ocean, mm. fully a, 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 a world exhibi a exhibition dedicated to, to the ocean. And uh, uh, so, uh, our economy, our lives is in fact dominated by the ocean. I myself come or grew in the Azores Islands in the middle, middle of the Atlantic, and the Atlantic mm. was my awakening. I, I was you lucky. You grew up in the Azores. Hmm? I, you grew up in the Azores. Islands. I grew up wow. as a scientist, I grew up in the mm. Azores. And uh, it was my awakening, in fact. My life was dedicated to scrutinize the, the, the oceans. I with the sea mammals, with, with the, the cetaceans, I could understand that they move, they consider it an ocean, they move north to so, south to north, north to south, they stop in the enriched areas of the sea mounts to feed, to feed their calves, I, so that's the horizontal, and they dive at 2,000 meters deep to find food, the rich 
parts of the ocean who have these huge squids, the giant squids, and or the sea turtles that move across the ocean from west to east, uh, or even entering in the Mediterranean and then returning to reproduce in the, the beaches of Florida, spending all their, their, their use in the area of the Azores. That was what we call the lost generation, because nobody knew where were the young, uh, the adolescent of the sea turtles. <laughs> or, the, you know, the jamantas, this seems pelagic fish that go on the surfaces feeding on the plankton, and we discover that they dive daily at 2,000 meters deep, oh. exploiting the deep scattering layers. Mm -hmm. So the ocean is, in fact, uh, one ocean is connected from the surface to the bottom of, of, of the sea. And uh, we are now entered, going to... to but, but yes, I also learned about the fourth dimension, time, and the, the, the changing that is being happening in the ocean. Uh, that we will talk for probably sure. uh, during this, this debate. Um, and so, uh, we are now beginning the third ocean, uh, national ocean strategy, where science is the umbrella uh, to, uh, in fact, um, build a healthy blue economy uh, based on a good governance. And this is the sea. We, we have since the 80s, a wonderful, magnificent um, uh, law of the sea, convention of the law of the sea, and that it is based on peaceful use of the oceans and, and, um, and um, precautionary knowledge. But of course, the scientists and the politicians have to work together to do the gov good governance, but some politicians can do very bad governance. But the, the scientists cannot do the governance uh, <laughs> based on themselves, so <laughs> they have to use. And now there is the, uh, the issue of, of, uh, of society, and society, politicians and, and, uh, and scientists cannot do that by themselves together. They need social authorization. That's why we also need that we have uh, um, uh, a society that is well well versed, right? well versed, yeah. and and formed, and uh, so uh, our ocean strategy is, of course, uh, is based on the, you know, the 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 agendas that are, are built around is on the agenda 2030 of the sustainable development, where finally we have a standalone uh, objective on the sea that does not exist before. Because the, the ocean was this kind of thing that um, uh, seemed, uh, it, it was opaque, in fact. The ocean was opaque and it seemed that it could be untreatable, nothing could threat the, the ocean, and uh, inexhaustible. Everybody could you remember this, there was this, um, how was his name, this lawyer that uh, from the 16th century, uh, Hugo, Hugo Grossius, Grossius, that yep. he says on this, work about the Freedom Marley the Barrel, seas. that uh, mm -hmm. if we exploit the rivers and we've exploited the, 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 the forest, we will have problem, but nothing will happen to the, in the sea and the right. ocean. And uh, we are, we wake up very late. And mm. let me tell one thing, that's one thing that still puzzled me. How the oceans were, or the issue of the ocean was a way from the, the convention of the climate conventions. It was in, did separate. Uh, Paris, in, Paris yeah. 15, uh, in Paris in 2015, there is no mention to the ocean. In 2005, the agreement, right? And uh, in 2015, and even in Madrid, uh, the chill, the chill uh, uh, nothing. Now in Glasgow, yes, we have a reference. What <laughs> puzzled me is not having a reference in there, is that the oceanographers, like Roger Revel in '57, already previewed what was going to happen in a seminal paper where he says, we are doing uh, a geophysical, uh, geophysical experiment, he was a oceanographer, uh, that cannot, could not be done before, cannot be repeated, is to bring up to the atmosphere all the, the, um, the CO2 that will disturb our climate. And it was also another, another, another oceanography, William St Stroker, that created the word global change and brought the, 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 
the, the Senate in the United States to deal with the issues and then, then create IPCC. And only in 2019, the IPCC did the report on the ocean and the cryosphere yes. for the first time. Okay. So the ocean is so important. Most of the problem has to be solved, in fact, um, on land, because we have to change our way of, of doing. But uh, it's been a kind of uh, the thing that is there, and we don't need to care too much because it will support everything. And now we know it will not support and will disturb. Is disturbing our way of life. Good. From the Portuguese to uh, the Australian ambassador, thanks for your patience on this. Um, what is the Australian view about sustainable oceans? Uh, you talked. We know everybody talked. That we're kind of late to the the party, if you will, in focusing our attentions on governance of this final frontier. Uh, what sort of model can Australia play? How do you see it in terms of uh, the indigenous communities, uh, the importance of uh, building sustainability into the model of the Australian economy at the same time? Yeah, well, look, thanks, John. And uh, I want to acknowledge, I think, the point that uh, the minister made about, uh, you know, we're late to this whole issue about the climate oceans nexus and how critical, I think, as uh, the professor said that uh, you know they're not separate terms. You know the, the oceans and the climate are, are one in many ways, and I think the fact in governance we often do have a way of at times trying to uh, look at issues through silos or certain perspectives. And I think it's it really and, and I will acknowledge the work of Portugal and some of our Pacific Island partners and, and Australia work closely uh, initially in Madrid and then in Glasgow to get the the climate ocean uh, oceans dialogue at the front centre and have it uh, a critical part of the. You have triple C process, but I think the question then, well, what does that mean going forward? And I think for, you know, one of the issues is the issue: how do we bring together science, and how do we bring together, you know, actually the wisdom and indigenous knowledge that comes from mm. thousands of years of managing and and dealing with with our oceans, and and actually sustainably managing our oceans. We think about sustainability as a new term, but. Indigenous communities and, and many people have managed sustainable practices on lands and oceans for, for thousands of years in the instance of Australia, you know, over 60,000 years. And so we're now increasingly realising how do we bring these two together? How do we use science as a way to really understand the value, the risks, the importance of our oceans? But how do we also bring the, the knowledge and expertise that comes from Indigenous communities? And I think if we're going to deal with this global issue, we need to bring these two together in a much more direct way. From Australia's perspective, I mean, I think um, yeah, that, that is an area that we uh, are looking at trying to really invest a lot more in. How do we bring those two elements together? And through that, how do we bring it together in terms of a, a way of a national oceans accounting? How do we better mm. value, in a whole broader sense, what our oceans value is from a biodiversity, from a blue carbon, from an environmental, from, from, a, from a monetary side as well. Because like I say, if you can't value it, then you don't value it. And mm -hmm. I think that as we look at the increasing challenges around dealing with oceans and environment, we need to better understand what we've got in a very broad sense. And in doing that, letting that inform the decisions and, and, and investments that get made to manage our oceans in a much more sustainable way. But just a quick uh, follow-up, if I may, Ambassador. Uh, it sounds like that's a pretty long journey. How do you accelerate the journey mm -hmm. to give that sense of urgency? And there's also public awareness mm -hmm. that this needs to take place. I, I, don't, I don't want to put it out there in kind of the ether, but I want to put it very grounded. Like, how do you accelerate this process? Because well, it's an urgent one. Maybe I'd just give three quick examples. Mm -hmm. One of them is to say, well, as I mentioned, is actually investing in the, the accounting measures of our ocean's environment. So that we and we do have the information, we have the analysis through satellite imagery and other areas. We can actually, you know, in a much more direct way, understand the biodiversity, of the oceans, and elements that come from that. And so, how do we collectively try and map that and bring that together in a way where we can give transparency and, and openness on that value? A, a second way in is, you know, we increasingly know coming out of the climate, uh, the, 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 the Glasgow, that we are going to have to look at ways where we can invest in. In, in carbon market mechanisms that can incentivise and drive greater action. Blue carbon was one of the big focuses at Glasgow, uh, rightfully. And this is realising the value our oceans have if we invest in them to actually help in uh, taking the direct climate action we need, sequestering carbon. We know blue carbon sequests five times the amount as, as land-based um, elements. 
So how can we use market mechanisms to really incentivise value and, and, and put greater um, uh, support, particularly for local communities in that space as well? And the third one I'd say is, is I think it's been touched on, is the work that's been done now coming out of the, 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 the UN Environmental Agency discussions, and, and we know with the Climate Biodiversity Convention that's going on, is, is also the challenge of plastics, marine plastics in our oceans. Yeah. And how do we get the urgency on a treaty to ensure that we can uh, be putting in the, the measures and policies to deal with uh, uh, the, the, the challenge and the impact plastics is having across so many communities. And I'll just finish by saying that we all grew up with the stories of throwing the, the bottle over the ocean and the, the message bottle landing somewhere. Well, on the other side, unfortunately, we're dealing with that exact issue that Professor mentioned of the fact that ocean, the, the plastics that might be in one river system very quickly turn into another, another marine coastline's problem. So we need the governance structures to ensure that we can really deal with that going forward. Okay, great. I wanted to come to Melania and have you address also this wealth gap, right, and the science that's done in the developed world vis-a-vis -vis the developing world. Mm -hmm. Is there, Are there resources being set aside uh, for the developing world to protect this one ocean, right? Mm -hmm. uh, there's exploration. You see the Chinese have even made gestures to plant flags mm -hmm. off the east coast of Africa mm -hmm. and with hopes of rare earth uh, minerals. Is this something that you, you're alarmed by that as we try to govern this with you know, Portugal and Australia, for example, developed mm -hmm. economies, the developing world, Africa, Latin America, Southeast Asia, some pockets of Southeast Asia uh, don't have that mm -hmm. capability. I'm going to try to answer that question by integrating several things that people have said. Um, it's, it's fascinating how the ocean is one and this conversation is becoming also one from so many different angles and, and perspectives. Uh, following up on the, what the ambassador just said, um, it's really important that uh, we are starting to see several sectors and pieces get unlocked and that uh, acceleration that you are asking about, it's, it's becoming exponential and it began, I believe, maybe there was, there was also momentum before, but by integrating an SDG, SDG 14 and putting in the world map that the ocean was important and critical, in critical shape, um, it also is the only of the SDGs that has its own very own ambassador, uh, Peter Thompson, whose job is to tell the world why having this SDG is important. And still, despite that, in 2018, when there was a survey of 3,500 world leaders and they asked them to rank by priority the importance of the SDGs, the, the, uh, the SDG 14 was bottom last, except for the islands of the South Pacific, where it was highly prioritized. And I believe this also mm. reflects where the finance is going. The finance is going to other SDGs without recognition that SDG is one of the ones that allows the other SDGs to get unlocked. For example, if you want to eliminate poverty, we need the jobs that the ocean provides. If we want to eliminate hunger, we need to also mm. unlock um, the, the protein that, that is sourced by the ocean. So this interconnection, again, uh, brings me to the question that you addressed about the need for there to be um, fair access to the generation of technology and also the use of the science uh, produced uh, worldwide. And if we look at where the oceans have been most explored, it's generally in the global north. And this reflects exactly where the majority of research centers, research vessels, and great institutions are that have funding for doing these really expensive endeavors. So, um, as you said, I'm from a developing country, but I have um, acted my career in the, for the majority of it in the, in the United States and in Europe. So I have seen this discrepancy and this gap that exists uh, in the resources that my colleagues in Costa Rica have access to. And uh, they are, of course, uh, approached to do science uh, because we have this wonderful nature and these wonderful extensions in the ocean. Uh, but the amount of um, human capital that is trained has become really evident in the pandemic. It, it is uh, evident that once the researchers couldn't visit and couldn't do their field work for two years, if they had trained the local scientists to do it for them, there wouldn't have existed this huge gap in knowledge that now uh, has, has, uh, has turned out to be. So, so we really need to uh, train people in these countries so that when they show up to the negotiations uh, for treaties and for conventions, they have the knowledge, they have the, the indicators and the metrics about their own ecosystems, and then they can come and negotiate in favor of their own interests. Well, very quickly, Melania, uh, the amount of money set up for the Green Fund out of the COP26 was 
I think $100 billion. They talk about tapping $130 trillion of financing, uh, which would be great for driving innovation. But uh, the allocation for the oceans and what you're suggesting here is minuscule, is it not? Uh, exactly. I, I am not sure about that particular number, but, but in general it tends to be. And it also tends to be allocated in local currency, which of course is very vulnerable to fluctuations. So, so this conversation about finance has to recognize the, the limitations and also the, the type of financing um, that, that these local um, developing countries need. Good. Professor Bert Jones, you're working on a very interesting project in the Red Sea. And could, could it serve as a case study, if you will, in the Vision 2030 plan that uh, His Royal Highness Mohammed bin Salman has, that you can develop a, a tourism sector and at the same time preserve this pristine area, that it actually can help in that process or not? Is this uh, t TBD to be determined whether it can be successful? I think given the actions that they're taking, I think it will be successful. Hmm. And, um, you know, the first thing they're going to do is, is uh, just put in no take zones for fisheries. That alone, all of a sudden, you're going to have a return of the fishes which have been absent from the coral reefs for many years. A second part of that uh, ties in uh, to developing a, a very sophisticated integrated sensing system for the ocean. And the sensing, you know, traditionally we, we've been able to measure physical and chemical and some biological variables very easily, but we're now moving beyond that. We're sensing organisms and, and we can potentially do that in, in, in real time. The idea is you're, you're putting that into the entire network of managing that community. So you're going to determine, you know, diving will be scuba diving, uh, snorkeling will be an intimate part of it. But you're going to determine where those divers can go. It may be if the dugongs are, or the sea turtles are coming ashore and we don't want them dis disturbed, that can be managed. So the idea is to develop a, a very uh, um, detailed management plan that allows them to regulate the use and activities in the sea. And I think, you know, going back to, to what the ambassador said about the indigenous peoples, I think uh, one of my visions is, is that by, by we can, we've up to now tended to use technology to overcome things. And I think we now, we're now at a place where we need to use the technology rather than to overcome to look how to live, we can use it to learn how to live in harmony, going back to what the indigenous peoples used to have to do without all of that. But because we've segregated ourselves into cities and everything else, we have that physical disconnect, but we need to de redevelop that connection and that intimacy with nature. And I think, uh, maybe it comes from my engineering background, but I have hope that, th that we can develop tools that allow us to come back to that intimacy and that understanding of that interdependency. Good, but you're unleashing the technology to do so, which is interesting. Correct, yes. Okay, even in sound, I think, is another one, an area you're looking at. Yeah, we're, we're, you know, it's fascinating. Um, you know, I, I think somebody mentioned earlier, sound is, is really important. Uh, the larvae that settle on coral reefs key in on the sound of the reef. Does it sound good? Does it sound bad, and, and, and one of the parts of our sensing system is the acoustics. But the other thing we're able to do, we're able to put sensors on things like the, the tridacnids, the big clams, and we can sense their activities then. How are they feeding, you know, are they closing <laughs> up, and you know, we can see that, and, and, and we can track that in real time. I've got another project that's just spinning up. We are um, putting sensors on sailfish, and they're a little bit more offshore, but we're trying to understand how are they responding to the ocean immediately. You know, I've got my robots out in the ocean characterizing the ocean structure, and then we're going to see where the sailfish are mm -hmm. going to in utilizing that structure. So we're trying to get a handle on their behavior. It's dangerous. It has the potential. It not only gives us the potential to protect, but it gives us the potential to exploit. And that's sort of that delicate balance, I think, that we face as humans, is using our tools to either exploit or 
or uh, sustain. Okay, I'm going to circle back to that, but I wanted to bring in uh, Jason from DP World to see how confident, from your perspective, because of your role in uh, group health, safety, and environment, that innovation uh, and investment in R&D can give you the breakthroughs you need in shipping. You're uh, intricately aligned with a number of developing uh, economies, to, to Melania's point here. They're very dependent on DP World onshore operations and the connectivity in global shipping. Do you have confidence that we can get the innovation in the shipping sector fast enough? I mean, is there the focus to, to do so now? And that's a major task because, you know, I covered the Ever Given, that thing lodged in the, <laughs> you know, yeah. in, uh, in Egypt, in the Grand Canal there. Um, what do you think? How do you see it today? Well, I, I think it, it, it's in pockets. Um, I think if you look at the challenges in the emerging markets, um, you know, and just providing base education to them of what the need is, um, having the skill sets there to bring in the innovation. Well, we bring in the technology, for example, but having people be able to, to run it, uh, creating new uh, jobs and careers and opportunities for them. Um, I, I, I have faith. I have actually a lot of faith in regards to us being able to move forward. But I think just talking about some of the things today is I'm a huge believer in nature-based solutions. Um, we, we're very much focused on technology, but we also need to focus on nature-based solutions. Um, man mangroves, for example, are, are a huge nature-based solution. It's part and key to uh, DP World's Oceans Health Strategy. Um, for example, we've, I think we've, I think we completed four projects last year on mangrove plantations, of several on uh, reef uh, restorations, but. Yeah, the, the, the technologies, um, I still think in, on the broader shipping section is still very much in the R&D phase. Um, but, and how does that, how do we globalize that and, and versus just having it in certain pockets? Good. Um, and how can Yeah, a lot of people don't benefit? want to acknowledge the fact that they're dependent on the ships, right? Yeah. It's like not in yeah. their backyard type of thing. Yeah. They need it, right? But uh, they're not so clear how connected they are to those giant... Uh, yeah. Super and and right? policy has a, a big role in this in regards to we know where Europe is heading, but where are these other e regions that we're operating that will mandate what, what type of technology we have to implement or, or solutions. So I think that's the broader challenge is, is uh, we're not all on the same page. Right. Yeah. Um, I think we have to go into, and uh, Kathleen, this is one of your specialties. I'd love to hear uh, the minister on this. And I'm going to just open it up to the entire panel because it's a very important one because there's a great hunt for rare earth minerals, as everybody knows today. Uh, they're used in mobile phones, they're used for battery storage uh, in solar and wind technology, they're used in electric vehicles. It's the, kind of the great hunt today. Uh, China's been planning for it for the last three decades, and they can do that planning uh, not being a democracy, so they have the, the kind of the art of uh, long-term planning that can stay sticky in terms of government. Uh, how do you see it, Kathleen, from a legal standpoint, uh, trying to govern what is, you know, the, the gold rush of the 21st century. Do you want to pick it up? Yeah, um, I think um, we, um, uh, the minister here discussed about um, the, the, you know, Hugo Grotius and uh, the freedom of the seas. Um, there's a very big tension with uh, the law of the sea offers um, the oceans and the deep seabed, particularly where all these minerals are, is the common property of all mankind. That's actually in the Law of the Sea Treaty. And so in that sense, um, these minerals, whether for financial purposes or otherwise, they are seen as all our property. But the marine biodiversity that we need to protect that's going to sustain our lives and life on this planet, which is our planet, which is you know beyond us, really, because we're not just talking about us as humans. We're talking about all these wonderful creatures that we share it with. I mean, we, we really need to be looking at it. First of all, we've talked about amongst ourselves the precautionary principle, which is this concept that we protect things when we don't have the knowledge. And we can't have all the science and all the knowledge. Um, and we need to get... Sure, we need to some science, but we need to say, look, first of all, we're going to protect what we don't know. So we're looking at marine biodiversity first as an international community. We don't have existing licences. I'm not sure what's happening under the table, shall we say. But there are no existing licences have been issued by the International Seabed Authority. 
um, and the nations have been uh, in New York this week, timely enough, negotiating what we're calling the High Seas Treaty, which is about, it's basically the closing remarks there were, look, we need to remember this is all of mankind's, all of humankind's property. It's um, small states, the developing states, as well as the developed states, and the developed states need to take full consideration of the developing states. How, and the main thing we're, we're doing here is we're going about protecting marine biodiversity first. So that's the plants and animals that we share this planet with. And so they're working at it from that point of view. We're looking at nature, we're looking at protecting nature first, and, and then we'll, we'll see what's happening in terms of granting these licences. But in the end, we all know that politics, international, national, it's all based on uh, communities and, and decisions that are made, you know, by commerce and things like that. So we need to bring these people all the time, I keep saying, we need to bring in effective frameworks, in effective legal frameworks, you need to make sure that everybody has a say and an equal say at the table. We need to mm. listen to each other. We need to listen to Indigenous knowledge. And I think we need to, not only as scientists, go and teach Indigenous people, no, no offence, Melania, mm. but, you know, <laughs> we need to learn from them. You know, scientists need to learn from Indigenous people. We mm. as lawyers need to learn from them. I've been fortunate enough to be involved in developing legal frameworks we, where we co-manage parts of what Indigenous people call sea country. So they recognise this planet, this planet that we're on, spinning around, is all of us, it belongs to all of us, and our legal frameworks need to reflect that and we need to work hard to do that. But we also need to remember it's not just us, it's not just humans here. It's, it's a whole living being. When you go up in space, when you read, you go downstairs to the terror, the ocean, they, they have statements from space and, and the astronauts are saying, I looked, I looked at it and I suddenly, it was the most colourful thing that I saw. It was, it was full of blue and green, but it was home. Mm. Uh, so I think, I think we need to be a bit more, I know I, I'm not your typical lawyer as everybody probably has realised, <laughs> but, but I, I think we need to not just take this humanistic point of view when we're thinking about how we create frameworks and... And I think that's what the governments are starting to do with these blue carbon. And well, it's interesting because there's some major players that need those rare earth minerals, as you know, mm. uh, Ambassador. Do you want to say how do you balance these stakeholders that have the demand? That China mm. controls 85% uh, of the processing of those rare earth minerals today. That's 56% of supplies. I think it'd be good to hear from you as well. Let's start with Ambassador, and I'll bring you in, Minister. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I think th th that's right. I mean, we know if we're going to be able to achieve the transition that we need to uh, get to net zero uh, and be able to keep temperature rises within the, the Paris goals of, 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 uh, of under 2 degrees and as close to 1.5 degrees possible, we're going to need to have the innovation, the technologies, the investments in that. Uh, and it does involve rare earth or minerals and it does involve... Uh, us looking at new ways of 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 manufacturing and managing uh, our resources. I come back to the thing that I think though that if you're going to make those decisions and you're going to manage the different uh, paths, there's two things. One, I think, as Kathleen said, it needs to have the voices of a range of stakeholders, so it's not just uh, a couple of key determiners determining what will be um, exploited or not. But secondly is, again, coming back to that issue of actually understanding what we've, when you're making decisions on, on issues, what the value of our oceans, what the value mm. of our coastlines, of our blue carbon is, if we're going to make a decision that we're going to, uh, in, in some way or another, potentially uh, exploit it or utilise it. And so that information, I think, sometimes we sort of look at it as a secondary thing. It comes back to this problem of sort of, we're late to the game. We see the the, the benefits of, of licensing or, or opportunities without fully understanding what those long-term implications are. So I think it comes back to that uh, oceans accounting, understanding the environmental assets we've got, and in doing that, how you know stakeholders can can then come together and make the the, the decisions we've got. And sometimes, honestly, it is hard decisions. There's not one simple way through on this. And we have got some real difficult challenges to deal with if we're going to be able to 
uh, reduce uh, and transition from a carbon heavy economies mm. to a net zero future and but we need to know how we're going to do that in the most sustainable way and what what payoffs we're making to yeah to this is an extraordinary panel for the world modules i got to say because you can take a deep dive in a subject that's often overlooked if you don't mind i'd like to get your thoughts linked to my opening comments about exploration or exploitation how do you strike the right balance and i think it'd be interesting against a scientific of you as well. And Melania, I'll bring you back into the conversation. Please, Minister. Let me tell you, uh, on the issue of deep-sea mining, there is no exploitation yet. No at all. We were very close on um, Solara in uh, Papua New Guinea, but it, uh, it failed. And the community had a role on that. But I, I must concede that the issue of minerals was already well integrated and under convention of the law of the sea. That's why we created the, the International Seabed Authority. Biodiversity or, or genetic resources were not, uh, or uh, acidification of the oceans and all these kind of things were it's not. That's why we are battle now mm. with, with the BBNG. Mm. But uh, yeah, it was. I believe that uh, one day, uh, and I hope, I hope later than sooner, we will be exploiting uh, some minerals in the deep sea. So the economy will be is pushing for that. I don't know, the industry. But um, it will, it will, when it will happen, it will affect biodiversity, for sure. And uh, so it is better to, we are clear, well prepared, technologically and good knowledge, if we go Mm. on exploitation of yeah, just for the clarity of our, our audience let me watching. see that just you, excuse you, me for a second just give us a timeline is that uh you know if i didn't know anything about this sector at all is it a 10-year horizon for exploration yeah, for these rare earth minerals it, it depends in the, also it depends how circular economy will deal with um with uh, re, uh, with uh, you reuse of minerals it mm -hmm. will depend I, I really i don't want to do, to do that scale on my point of view if we could <laughs> be spared for of exploitation of deep sea minerals, I would be happy. Uh, let me see. We do not have enough knowledge. You heard already this, this uh, sounding uh, idea that we know more about the, yeah. the moon. Than, uh, okay, we have uh, good knowledge, but we know we don't have good resolution on the mapping of the ocean. We need a lot more resolution. We have this area that is Clarion Clapperton with huge area, bigger than the United States in the Pacific, which is um, the area, is ICs, is the area. And uh, we know that there is these um, um, uh, manganese nodules full of, of, of minerals. Um, it's too deep, 5,000 meters, but it's one dimension or two dimension. When we come to the talking about polymetallic sulfides or cobalt crusts and things like that, we don't know. We don't have the third dimension. We don't know what is there. We, mm. But... Uh, and so, um, and then we have these myths. I remember in the in 2000, in the early 2000, that we have to go on a rush for copper. Yes. We know it didn't happen. We need to manage the copper you use. If you go to some cities to to the Asia, you see all the redundancy they use the copper. It's it's. So we need to manage better the the grids, the electric grids. We are now going on Wi-Fi. And, but in those times, we were saying we have to go and rush to the copper. Copper never the time, but there was this, uh, this publicity. Right. So, uh, in concerning uh, radar minerals, or we call uh, uh, technological minerals, uh, I don't know which. I, I'm not a geologist. I'm not, but be careful with the geologist. Huh? <laughs> 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 uh, but uh, uh, we are not in a stage. So. I believe that a moratorium is a good idea to keep the society and uh, the politicians in a, in a, a planning, a, a, a better planning. I don't know how, how long the only the only the, the economy and what we will be, uh, be able to do on our concept of circular economy uh, will tell us. Uh, but if we go there, we should be. Uh, really uh, very cautious cautious with good technology and we with good um, knowledge 
Good. Uh, Professor Jones, good to hear what your thoughts on the Red Sea, because you said that it uh, has deposits. I was talking to you about the Nubian shield, that the, the yeah. Arabian shield that everybody's very excited about in the mining sector for this reason onshore in Saudi Arabia. Uh, right. Are you in the camp that says, let's you know, forestall this effort? Uh, I, I think, yes. I, I would say, let's, let's not be in a rush. Um, you know, in the Red Sea, one of the deepest parts of the Red Sea has very large deposits that are jointly held, I think, both by Sudan and by Saudi Arabia. And there's been a lot of talk for, for years about mining them, and partly the technology hasn't been there yet, but it's coming. Um, and the question, but these environments, this particular environment I'm thinking, which is just offshore from Jeddah, but it's one of the deepest parts of the Red Sea, is a very unique ecosystem on the planet. We're, we're looking at a, the Red Sea is considered a young ocean. It's a spreading rift zone between the African and the Arabian plates. And so, uh, you know, the geologists are using it to understand what the other, how the other oceans developed and evolved. But with that, down in these deposits, because it's a rift zone and the water that goes into the crust draws out the minerals from the crust and then they come out into the ambient ocean and they precipitate. So they're large, there's tens of meters of deposits in this area. But as I say, it's a unique ecosystem. We don't fully understand that ecosystem yet. It's, it's a bacterial ecosystem. The uh, planetary astrobiologists are using these ecosystems to understand life on other planets when they go looking for life somewhere else in the universe. What does it look like? Because these think, they think these environments are characteristic of it. These are areas people are looking at the, the organisms because they have enzymes which are not found otherwise in nature but potentially have industrial applications. There's the, also the potential of pharmaceuticals and other things that can be found. So if we go start exploring, exploiting these, before we understand the other, the ecological aspects of it, we have the potential to destroy it before we knew what we had. Okay. I think we should make the, the connection, and this is something I know you're quite passionate about, Melania, uh, between final frontier of space and the final frontier <laughs> of the oceans, right? Yeah. There's a connection between the two. One is a technology and the ability to take a, a very hard peek because of satellite technology today of what's going on in the seas. But how do you see the relationship between the two? I think I love that you brought it up, Kathleen, because I think the inspiration that we we have drawn over the last few decades about ocean exploration, sorry, about space exploration, uh, we have sort of forgotten about uh, how magnificent and mysterious ocean exploration is also. And I was reminded, and maybe some of you saw the pictures of the discovery of the, the vessel of the Endurance last week uh, off of Antarctica in the Weddell Sea. And this is a vessel that was hidden for 106 years from one of the great explorers of the of the times when when the poles were were the race to get to the South Pole and the North Pole. Um, and and I draw a lot of inspiration normally from Carl Sagan, who referred to the Earth as the pale blue dot. Uh, and and notice the color that he he re reflects also what astronauts speak about when they go to the space station or when they or when they go to the moon. Um, and, and in terms of this, again, bringing it back to equality and fairness, I think we have talked about the, the imbalance between developing and, and um, uh, developed countries, but I also wanted to bring in the angle of gender uh, that is really important because in both the areas, uh, diplomacy and science that we have referred to as part of the solution, there are, there are still huge gaps in the access of women to those decision-making tables. Um, in science, for example, we, we talk about the schematic of the leaky pipeline that the women, although they are entering at about 50% of the flow into the pipeline of science uh, or at the undergraduate degree level, uh, they are not really becoming the PIs, the principal investigators, the, the leads of the projects in science. Mm. And I am not as familiar with diplomacy, but we have never seen a secretary general at the UN, so I think that sort of tells you. Um, that there's still like a gap in, in gender in, in those circles. So I think uh, many people are thinking that the, the problem will get solved if we just inspire girls more and that the problem is a problem of lack of inspiration 
maybe they haven't seen Jacques Cousteau's videos or they haven't seen the pale blue dot nar narrative of Carl Sagan, uh, but we're forgetting about the, in my opinion, harder problems that are to fix those gaps in the pipeline, to, to, to fix those places where the women, the women are leaking out of the pipeline. And, and that entails um, providing them support so that the domestic roles don't just fall on their shoulders, so that they don't have to get uh, or do all this uh, labor, unpaid labor, that takes away time, takes away mental energy from which they could be dedicating to science or diplomacy or any other field that they want to excel at. So I think the angle of gender is also one of the ones about equality that uh, in order to solve this problem has to be integrated into the discussion. And again, there's an SDG for that and it's connected also to the SDG of oceans in that way. Well, you make a, a phenomenal point because we learned during the pandemic, it fell disproportionately on women that had to have yeah, these right. roles. Uh, so working at home and trying to make an income too. Exactly. Uh, Kathleen, do you want to share any thoughts in the gender space? Absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> I kind of um, felt the heat coming. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, I actually was very fortunate. Um, there was a, an amazing uh, women in, on International Women's Day. I was very fortunate to come along and intent, attend both the forums here. Katia sponsored it. And the uh, CEO of Katia stood on an open stage in Al Wassel, and I think Melania, Melania and other women in the audience, and he said he touched exactly on that point. He said, we, in a, in a full audience, he stood up there and he said, we need to do the ironing, do the shopping, look after the children to enable our women to share. Because in the end, if we want to create solutions to the problems for this planet, mm -hmm. it's Mother Earth and it's women. And we need more women in leadership, in my, in my view, not all women, just uh, more women, and we need them to be comfortable to have their voices heard. And I think in, in legal sectors, I mean, we were one in three, and I had two lecturers from Stanford, and they were both women. We were told one in three, and you'll, you'll be out of your legal career, for, you know, in five years. Wow. Yeah. Why is so, that? I think it's, um, it's existing in a society that has largely been developed no, no offence, but largely been developed for men. So women don't even know really who they are because we've all, always lived in this... Um, I'm not going to shift completely over to gender, but we've always li lived in a patriarchal society. So we, we even are, are defining ourselves. Um, what we bring to the table is, is, is different. We, we talk about connection. And we, when I go to a negotiation... I sincerely want to hear from the miners. I want to hear from everyone. I was, when we were doing these negotiations with the fishermen, in the end, the men sent me on my own to speak with the fisheries groups because <laughs> they just end up in, in, in tension and arguing. And I'd go there and say, okay, we're not discussing, we're protecting, um, there's a goal to protect 30% of our planet. So 30% of the oceans and, and the UAE signed up as well by 30-30. So it's called 30 by 30. And, and, and I, I believe we need to go to these negotiations and, 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 and go for these goals. So when I go in with fishermen, I said to them, we're going to protect 30% of the Great Barrier Reef because that, that was our goal as well scientifically. It's proven you protect 30%. And, and, um, and they'd say to me, no, 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 we're taking away, you're taking away our fishing areas. And it was like, well, no, we're going to conserve these marine protected areas. And I've been out to this one moon island offshore here and I've been out there before it was the marine reserve it's the latest marine reserve in the UAE and I've been out since and I'm sure the fish know because suddenly there's huge queen fish and huge numbers of fish anyway the fishermen they end up when you tell them we're not going to discuss we're protecting 30 percent so what we're going to discuss is how we can work together they listen and they work together and then you know what they come back they call you on the phone and they say don't tell you know the agency you're working with but they're working. These no-take areas are working. Mm. So what we need to do is at least get this, the deep seabed. We need to at least get 30% protected. And we need to know at, at least where to protect it. And I, I believe they're going to start the, I've heard, 2025. So uh, I'm a bit worried about the exploration of the, of the minerals starting a lot earlier because uh, the UK, I think, wants to have electric vehicles by 20. 
Well, they want the entire infrastructure built by 2030. 2030. You talked about infrastructure for DP World, right? It's just, it's the same yeah. issue, right? You got to get the infrastructure right. Uh, the rare earth minerals that are needed for electric vehicles and battery storage. The overdependency on countries like the Congo right now is a, a major issue. I wanted to make sure our microphones are available. Uh, if we can get the, the team ready, because well, after the final next question here, do we have any questions from the floor? Because we want to have this dialogue in the last 25 minutes. We have one here, halfway down. Uh, Let me tell one thing. If this was uh, do you have a, a question? A way, no. If we, <laughs> if this was a way to stop blood minerals, yes. we had a case. <laughs> yeah. No. That, that that's a, a huge that's issue. That's one of Do we have any other questions here? I ha would take give the gentleman that microphone. Do you have any other questions? Uh, please raise your hand if you do. Uh, just identify yourself, and if you can direct the question to one of the panelists, it'd be great. No. No. Minister Santos, yeah. Hello, hello, hello. There it goes. Yeah, just hold it a little bit closer. Okay. There we go. I'm Mario from Brazil. I'd like the government's perspective on framing both the threat and the opportunity. I know 80% is not known. But what I discovered this year, last year for the first time, and nobody ever spoke to me, is we've been complaining about climate change. It has to do with industrial emissions for the last 150 years. But... 80% of the world is covered by oceans, and on the bottom of the oceans, there's methane. And they say this is something like 100 or 200 times what we emitted the last 150 years. And if that melts down, that's going to the atmosphere, and that is a Permian extinction event. So I, I never heard anybody frame that, how that the t ticking time bomb of the methane on the bottom of the ocean. The yeah. And... Uh, the opportunities are like, well, I wonder, for instance, the plant a million corals, micro-fragmenting, and if I, avoiding regenerating the coral reefs, like the Great Barrier Reef. H how are we tackling this as an opportunity, as an industry, as something that's economically viable? Okay, good. There's almost two questions there, but let's try to break them down. I think, Bert, you'd be... Quite interesting. Have you ever studied methane accumulation in the bottom of the seabeds? Only because I've been asked about it by, by, by our vice president at one point. I, this is not my expertise, but I had to look into it, and I, he said, well, do we have them in the Red Sea? And when I looked into it, I said, oh, no, we can't because it's too warm. They need cold. They need combination of pressure and cold to keep them in the methane hydrate form. So, I mean, there is that potential. I, you know, with global warming and, and as the deep ocean warms, I, I haven't done a technical evaluation of it, and I don't actually know the magnitude of the methane hydrate, but I can foresee under certain conditions where that could be released, and, and yes, methane is a serious greenhouse gas, so. Yeah, well, that has been a huge issue with the shale industry, which they finally focused on the COP26, right? I mean, yeah. the methane leakage, and they have a commitment but not complete buy-in in, in, right. in that space. Ambassador, you want to jump in about the, the Great Barrier Reef, but also it links back to the blue carbon economy you're talking about, I think. Yeah, I mean, a couple of things. One, I think, um, again, I'm not a, uh, a scientist in relation to understanding all the issues of, of, of methane uh, under the oceans, but what I can say is I think it's well understood that increasingly as sea temperature rises and as ice, ice melts and also with... Uh, our climate changing, there is increasing evidence already of methane being uh, emitted, and as, we, as, as the professor said, that that is uh, in in the short to medium term sixty times six to, sixty times more uh, impactful than carbon dioxide, and so uh, absolutely the risk of sort of uh, further uh, releases of methane, either from exploration or from uh, climate change, is absolutely a critical issue that needs to be understood and 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 prevented and addressed. I think in terms of, your, your, if I was right, your second question around where are the opportunities to look at some of the uh, ways of, of investing or, or, or um, uh, assisting with uh, carbon sequestration or protecting of our coral reefs and the Great Barrier Reef, two things I'd say is one of them, as mentioned, I think the reason the blue carbon focus is important is because 
increasing realize, realization that actually investing in it, protecting it, and potentially uh, incentivizing greater investment in it uh, has direct benefits for our biodiversity, uh, climate adaptation, but carbon sequestration, as I mentioned. And I think how the international community works much more collectively on that is critical. There's the International Blue Carbon Initiative, which is focused on looking at bringing that expertise and knowledge together and through uh, a range of different satellite imagery and monitoring, uh, better tracking and understanding the, the value of blue carbon. On the issue of coral reefs, I think it, look, it, it, it's a challenging issue. We know for the Great Barrier Reef, climate change is the biggest threat. Uh, we know that increasing temperature rises is impacting on coral reefs, but, but also globally uh, for, for, for all coral reefs in different ways. And I think how we deal with and understand the ways that uh, we can try and invest and protect coral reefs in, in certain ways, what, what sort of adaptive technologies and approaches can be understood is one of the things that Australia is, is investing in and looking at how we share through the International Coral Reef Initiative ways of drawing in research and science on that, acknowledging that global climate action, reducing emissions is going to be the, one of them, is, is, is a critical issue around ensuring that we can try and keep those Paris goals uh, um, uh, temperature goals uh, in line and prevent the, the potential future impacts that come uh, from uh, heating of the climate on coral reefs and on, on our oceans. Great. A lot of you had your hand up, but I know you're a strong believer in the blue carbon economy. Do you want to pick it up? Yeah, I just wanted to address really quickly about methane. Um, the example you're providing is exactly the reason why the precautionary principle is there, because these are called feedback loops, not just in the case of the bottom of the ocean, but also in the permafrost of the Arctic, for example, there's so much uh, methane stored. So feedback loops, and in this case, positive feedback loops, what they do is they make the problem worse as we go because they trigger something else that accelerates or, or um, makes the, the problem larger. So in the case of the solutions and the opportunities, there are technologies, for example, satellite um, uh, remote sensing um, that is looking very in the future, in the near uh, future, looking to, with hyperspectral capabilities, monitor leaks uh, and, for example, pipelines to find the leaks of methane so that there can be response and, and you know, reactions quickly uh, to, to tackle that. And, and that is exactly the kind of technologies that I think provide us, provide us hope and that were, was also reflected at the government level at the last COP, at COP26, with the agreement of, uh, with carbon mapping and carbon mapper, uh, a specific satellite, um, to try to tackle this problem before it begins, before it begins in a, in a serious way. Great. Do we have any questions, uh, other questions from the audience here? Just put your hand up. I just want to make sure there's uh, an opportunity, please. Again, if you can identify where you're from and who you are, and if you can direct the question to somebody, that'd be great. I'll do my best. Uh, hello, my name's Larissa Constal from the United Kingdom, and I work in sustainable fisheries. Um, we make technologies um, to ensure that fishermen can continue doing their jobs and also to ensure that, as you have said, Melania, that you know they're providing for their families, we're ensuring there's protein, but also that we're... Um, conserving the biodiversity in the ocean. So I think everything that you've spoken about today, I thank you very much. It touches um, a lot in what I do. So my question is actually about the UN Global Conference. So um, Your Excellency, uh, Mr Santos, um, when Kathleen, Melania, even the members of the forum here are talking about introducing more local voices, indigenous voices, people from the wider um, communities that work in the oceans, how do you guarantee that in a conference as big and important as the UN Ocean Conference? We have the Ocean Conference coming up. I mean, <laughs> how do you make sure that the voices are heard here of multiple stakeholders? I think the society is uh, uh, well organized. And uh, who, the registration for participation was open to the end of... Um, of uh, February, and now is open the registration for side events. Uh, and this is also an important uh, way to participate in. Of course, there will be the, the interactive dialogues where we, we expect uh, the, the society to participate strongly, and these interactive dialogues are around the, the targets of SDG uh, 14. You mentioned one thing, I believe, 
it is that we didn't discuss much here, but it's one of the concerns of uh, of, uh, uh, of uh, our system is the IUU fisheries, hmm? and uh, IUU fisheries is 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 making the loss of uh, of uh, uh, monetary uh, or, or capacity in many countries. Af the ACP, Africa, Caribbean, and Pacific is losing 80 billion. Euro, uh, dollars a, a year because of shrinking fish stocks. Because no, because I, uh, IUU fisheries illegal, illegal and reported illegal. and unregulated. Oh, right. And this is something that is very difficult because criminal to to tackle. Um, there uh, we, we can identify. I don't want to be pessimist. Uh, let me be optimist in one sense. There is big progress on fisheries management. You have seen the the, the bluefin tuna recovering from. Years and years of, of depression, it is recovering. And when the science and the, the, the uh, regional um, um, councils for fisheries are able to work together and are able also to enforce the law, uh, we, uh, we show that with good management, we are able to recover, to recover the stocks of fish. Mm. And, uh, but there are some areas in the Indian Ocean, Africa is losing a lot of uh, uh, of money. Well, this is an interesting point. Due because, to no, but even the, the world economic IUU fisheries, which is very, very, very difficult to tackle. So, no, IUU no, fisheries you, will be one of the. No, but I was just wondering. We have that technology. That's why we wanted to bring up the connection between space and and the sea or the oceans. Yeah. At the World Economic Forum, they were using the, the satellite images yeah. of these super trawlers that were roaming through yeah. the Middle Pacific and going through the Indian Ocean, completely ungoverned, yeah. right? So what, what kind of commitment can you make here to say, with that technology, with that tracking uh, capabilities, if we can do it with an airplane, we can certainly do yeah, it with a it super it tanker. It, it is a, a really uh, an important tool. Uh, but uh, not the, the digitalization of the ocean is still weak when compared with, with land. And the satellites do not respond uh, uh, as quickly as possible. And uh, crime in fisheries is able to overcome and contour right. these, these things of things because the, the reality is, is, is clear, um, uh, is clear uh, defined. We know even the amount of money that is lost for the communities, for the, for the, for the, for, for the coastal communities with big trawlers, with big, uh, that, I, 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 uh, the, in, this is eventually one of the things that it, it has to be tackled very seriously. It needs international cooperation at all levels. Some areas still do not have uh, regional management uh, organizations. As you know, in the South, in the South Atlantic, there is lack of, um, of compliance, there is lack of vigilance, there is lack of, of reinforcement. Uh, in the North Eastern Atlantic, is very well managed, and uh, uh, but. Uh, um, all these countries from Africa uh, um, and the Pacific areas, they know clear what they are losing, and it is an international problem that needs to be tackled very seriously. Back to your point about the developing world having a voice uh, in these uh, uh, debates here. Uh, the other idea is that our, our international organizations, and that's in the world modulus spirit here, we're looking for solutions for the future. And you know, one of the complaints that we have now in the conflict with Russia and Ukraine is that our international organizations are just not nimble enough to deal with bigger challenges of today. I think mm. you'd be good to get your voice on that if you can, Ambassador. Yeah, I mean, I mean it, look, it's a, it's a, it is a difficult issue. I mean, take the example around fisheries and, and, and to say, well, we better understand and can track now where these large fishing visuals, illegal fishing is occurring. Everyone d disagrees with that. Um, the, the risk is that you come up with sort of a simple technical fix, or we just need to have more, you know, international compliance and 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 oversight and 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 regulation on that. But we also know that if you don't respect and understand, you know, the the the, the importance of local national structures, yes, they may not be perfect. Yes, we may live in a global world, and we may all want. But from experience, if you don't invest in those local elements, whether it's legal frameworks, compliance elements, the national structures, then you continue to have a global problem 
with limited ability to sort of hold accountability to it. So for me, it sort of comes from the, you've, you've got issue. to have the two ang angles of it. I think one of them, you've got to have uh, accountability, international treaties and, and, and clarity of what the, the, the rules are, the, the laws are. But you need to then ensuring that you've got building the capability and, uh, for compliance implementation uh, of that to occur. And I think that bottom-up, top-down approach has got to come together if you're going to be able to deal with these elements. I mean, you take the, the, the history of, of climate change, you know, we saw what happened in Copenhagen when you had a, a very top-down driven approach, approach and, and, and a falling apart of that agreement. Mm. The Paris Agreement, which uh, was, was much more bottom-up and many people were critical at times of that and saying, well, it's not ambitious enough, but it's got everybody, well, nearly everybody in it. It has a very strong peer accountability in terms of what the pressures, the ratcheting mechanism and saying, well, what are others doing? Are they doing enough and that? And that is really key. And I think in, in terms of dealing with some of the issues around fisheries or dealing with issues around plastics or whatever else, you need that international framework, but then you need to have that investment and that uh, cap capacity in, in, to ensure that local national solutions can, can then operationalise it. Good. We're in the last uh, seven or eight minutes here. Uh, Melania, I wanted to give you the, the, the final vote um, or voice on this. Uh, if you talk, uh, I have two daughters who are 16 and 19, and they kind of accuse... You're a baby boomer, right, uh, <laughs> Minister Santos? They could accuse the baby boomers of being pretty lazy, pretty slow to respond as a, as a the, the part of the human race here, that we're not living up to the challenges, got too comfortable, we we're too dependent on making money, didn't have to deal with conflict. Well, how do you get that sense of urgency and the focus on the oceans that is needed at this stage uh, and to shake things up? Oh. That's a difficult question. <laughs> I'm carrying the weight of closing. So I, I would invite everyone, if they can, to go visit a coral reef and to submerge their head <laughs> underwater and listen, like you were saying, listen to what a live, healthy coral reef sounds like. We have to rebuild that connection to loving these ecosystems so that we can protect them. I don't, I don't think you can protect something that you don't love. Um, so you have to find that personal connection first to uh, being marveled and being amazed by the things that we still have and think about the, what we can still save, not about what we can lose. Um, and, and then it connects to the other things that you love, your daughters, your grandchildren. It's going to connect right away. So, so I think if, if we have gotten too compliant, uh, too complacent, sorry, too complacent uh, and too slow, it is because maybe we have taken for granted the things that we love. Uh, and uh, in oceanography, we always say that uh, rising tide lifts off the boat, all the boats. Mm. And, and I think that tide is becoming dignity and protecting the dignity of future generations, the dignity of Aboriginal and Indigenous communities, of developing countries, of women. Once we start lifting all of those other boats and we start really like taking advantage of all the talent that is, you know, unlocked in there. So I think that that will start moving things faster, not just taking advantage of the talent and the privilege of a few. Yeah. Do we, do we take the ocean for granted, do you think, Kathleen? I, th I think we do, actually. I don't think I do and I don't think maybe the people here... I don't, but I, I think, I mean, I've spent time with many different people on the ocean, from sailors to fishermen, and I, I will say I think the fishermen are more connected to the ocean than, say, a sailor. I've seen people throwing cigarette butts and having no concept of there's a whole world living under there, you know. So maybe it, it, in our roles, you know, sort of as leaders, we need to inspire people more. We need to, you know, the Netflix... Uh, a documentary that was extremely popular. We, we need to somehow engage more and maybe at these UN conferences we need to have um, more people's areas where people can contribute, um, indigenous groups, you know. And, of course, this is about money as well. Not everyone can fly to a coral reef, you know, and some of the people in the most degraded sites will... They're just thinking about how to feed themselves. So we need to somehow engage... I'm a ground-up person. I will say a lot of the programs I've developed have been sitting on the location with a few people from different, different, you know, consultants and tourism people and Indigenous people. And I, I really believe we need to be able to have conversations like this. In fact, more than TED Talks, these sorts of conversations, but with 
with diverse, cross-functional, cross-level discussion. And I, I think we need to listen more. Well, this has been a, a fantastic forum because of the diversity on the panel, and I appreciate the questions from the audience. We wanted to run a video here, uh, looking forward to the UN conference that you'll be hosting. We'll get a taste, and then I'll get you to say, you know, what your aspirations are for that meeting. Can we listen to the and take a look at the video uh, now? Thank you. Salvar o oceano, preservar o futuro. Este é o mote de um encontro decisivo para o futuro da humanidade. Os atuais problemas do oceano vão muito para além da sobrepesca ou da poluição. O oceano global sofre de acidificação, aumento da temperatura média, desoxigenação e perda de biodiversidade. Mas uma nova era para o oceano pode começar em Lisboa. Em junho de 2022, a capital portuguesa recebe a Conferência dos Oceanos das Nações Unidas. Todos os Estados-membros da ONU são convidados a participar. Governos, empresas, organizações não governamentais e universidades vão dialogar sobre melhores políticas para uma governação sustentável do oceano. Há décadas que Portugal tem um papel fundamental na diplomacia do oceano. Hoje, mais do que nunca, o país está disposto a assumir responsabilidades na construção de um novo paradigma de gestão baseado no conhecimento científico e no equilíbrio ambiental, social e económico. Organizada em conjunto com o Quénia, a Conferência dos Oceanos das Nações Unidas vai definir ações para implementar o Objetivo de Desenvolvimento Sustentável 14 proteger a vida marinha. O tempo urge para concretizar este e os outros 16 objetivos da Agenda 2030 da ONU. A recuperação da pandemia deve orientar-nos para uma relação mais equilibrada com a natureza. O oceano é fundamental na regulação do clima, não só pela retenção dos gases de estufa, como pela redistribuição do calor a nível global. Tal como ficou bem reconhecido na última Cimeira Climática, a COP26, o papel do oceano é crítico no combate aos eventos extremos que têm vindo a afetar a humanidade. Para a pesca continuar a ser uma importante fonte de proteína alimentar, tem de ser encontrado um novo ponto de equilíbrio. Sabemos desde já que devemos olhar para o mar com outros olhos como fonte de recursos de forma sustentável. A aposta num oceano saudável é um investimento com retorno para o ambiente, para a economia e para toda a sociedade. Uma nova economia azul pode revolucionar os muitos usos do oceano. Nas rotas comerciais, na energia renovável, nas substâncias para fármacos, nas telecomunicações e muito mais. O mar é muito mais do que um recurso. É fonte de bem-estar espiritual. É palco de desporto, cenário de lazer. No oceano, vamos ser mais felizes. A humanidade é chamada a encontrar novas soluções, a alertar consciências e a alterar comportamentos, a reforçar a mensagem de que só juntos podemos salvar o oceano. A saúde dos oceanos está nas nossas mãos, em todos os pontos do globo. Cada um pode fazer a diferença. É urgente fazer as escolhas certas, agir, proteger, conservar e garantir um futuro melhor para as gerações da amanhã. Conferência dos Oceanos das Nações Unidas. O futuro do oceano decide-se em Lisboa. Very nice. We we'll give a round of applause for the video. They get I don't really want to attend the conference. I want to kind of get lost for two weeks afterwards, right? Uh, it's interesting you brought up uh, environmental, social, and economic balance as, yes. a, as a theme. Yeah. Do you think you can drive that home at the conference? We only have a minute for your final remarks. Okay, One thank minute. you very much. Just to tell that all these registrations uh, happen in the site of the United Nations, okay? That's where you have to look. And uh, what we hope is that we uh, strengthen the voluntary, because they are voluntary, compromises of 
the member states of the United Nations. And uh, we know that we are behind, behind, behind mm -hmm. the accomplishment of the targets that were defined on SDG 14. And uh, it is important that we improve. So the big, um, the big challenge is to bring the countries on the understanding that the voluntary compromises are important. Uh, this is not a COP, mm -hmm. so the compromises are to be voluntary. And, um, and uh, that we don't want a notion to be kept for observation, and we want a notion that is returning to its health and can be productive for the society and for our economies. I would like to remember that the first and second uh, sustainable uh, development goal are still hunger and poverty. And the ocean can contribute as food and resources, but it has to return to healthy. And the last remark, I would like to refer that we are on the decade of ocean science for sustainable development, but at the same time we are on the decade of ecosystem restoration that we'll refer here today. And if we don't restore some of the important ones, like the blue carbon uh, sink uh, uh, um, habitats, we will fail on this. Thank you. Thank you very much for that. Uh, for you want, those who want uh, additional information and those watching uh, from afar, uh, you can go to the virtualexpo2020.com website. That's the virtualexpo2020.com website. We have another uh, two more sessions when it comes to water that I'm chairing over the next two uh, evenings at the same time uh, here in Dubai. I really appreciate the organizers pulling together such a solid group of individuals, which is fantastic. And uh, we look forward to your questions and your feedback even online to the website. Uh, use it as a resource, not just through the expo, which is going to be finishing at the end of the month, uh, but to go back and taste uh, a discussion like this uh, to understand more about the challenges and the opportunities we have ahead. Can you please, in the audience, give a nice round of applause to our panelists today. Thank you very much.